Ministerial Advisory Board, the Private Enterprise Federation, Legacy Bonds Limited, and NDK Capital Limited. And he holds an MBA in finance and MA in economic policy management from the University of Ghana. He has been he has been instrumental in the development and implementation of major policies in the Ghanaian energy sector, notably the deregulation of the downstream petroleum sector and the conceptual development and rationalization of the Energy Sector Leverage Act and its consequent debt management interventions. And he was awarded the Oil and Gas Personality of the Year of the year in downstream of the year in 2016 in downstream by the Offshore Africa Magazine and the Africa Impact CEO Award by the Africa Leadership Magazine in 2017. Okay, so Honorable uh, Mr. Senior Hosi, you are very much welcome. Thank you very much. You are very much it's a welcome. pleasure to be here. And um, sorry for the challenges we've had with timing. Um, I think we had a little bit of a, some mis miscommunication. So you were rather build on my side for 1 p.m. Ghana time. Apparently you were waiting for 12. So um, sorry for waiting, making you wait. I hope we'll enjoy our session together. Yes, sir. Yep. Who's the MC? Over to you, MC. Hello. Yes, MC. Please, I couldn't hear what she said. I said over to you. Or do we start now? Yes, we start now. It is time for the speaker to speak. Okay. I'll see if I'll share screen. Yeah. And don't worry about the screen you see. It's not so important yet. So I will be speaking on the subject or the topic as advised by, advised there much earlier. Um, you in the future of work. I am very pretty clear, and I think you'd agree with me that one of the most important things that seems to bedevil the thoughts of uh, graduates uh, and uh, the youth today has to do with work, employability, and not just your ability to be employed, but your actual realization of that ability. So I'll start off with, uh, with some perspectives or some story I can share with you. Between myself and my registrar at the University of Ghana, some time back, his name was uh, Mr. A.T. Kono. And Mr. Kono, he was such a very fine gentleman. And he told me this one time, that in his days, all that they needed were only two E's from an A-level exam to enter the university. Employment in their time was effectively guaranteed with corporates and government uh, openings waiting for you to graduate. They were just waiting. Practically, you'd be hired right after school. Right in school, just before your graduation, you will be finding your next employer. But today, we are actually lucky or oh, better still, lucky are the few who graduate from university and get employed within 12 months of graduation after a national service. Even lucky are those who are able to jump into the world of work, a job waiting for them right after graduation. So for me, it was quite saddening, but not entirely surprising when a number of students practically accosted me in a car park to make known to me their affairs after my University of Ghana, my infamous University of Ghana boom, are you thinking? So these graduates or students uh, accosted me in the car park. 
and made known their fears to me about their employability after graduation. I quote, Mr. Hosey, my biggest worry at this time is whether I'll find a job after graduation. Unemployment has now become the default position for most of my seniors and my colleagues, and I think the same may be of me. Getting a job has now become an exception. When these two boys, young men, actually finished their submission, my heart actually sank, and I was pretty troubled. Their words haunt me to this day, and they'll continue to do so for a very long time to come. I remember that as a student going to the university, where I experienced the fullest of my freedoms, and an opportunity and assurance to end my economic dependence on my parents, I saw my seniors graduate to employment opportunities in low level management or management training programs. Others also got absorbed into the banking and, and some other service sectors. But over time, the quality of jobs for most graduates dwindled. I mean, that's my observation. As for the quantity, I'm pretty sure we were, we were, we were not that um, shortchanged in our, in our time. But when you look at today, I'm pretty sure that most of our unemployed graduates can speak to the matter better than I ever would. I was never in the ranks of what most see today, but I do feel the pain and a sense of desperation. And I look forward to a day when their story shall change with their fully employed, making impact in the various times and spaces they find themselves and setting a better future for the generations that will come. So like I said, I did not experience that. But in my time, I saw the quality of education or employment, sorry, drop. My seniors were hired into banks as major relationship managers. In our time, we got in as tellers, some as customer service agents. I started work as a sales and marketing executive. So you can actually see that the quality of our time had been doing that. But today, quantity is even a problem. Even at low quality, we do not have adequate employment. The statistical service says from its last census actually puts unemployment amongst the youth at 19.2%. The World Bank puts underemployment, which is not the same as unemployment, at 50%. So it effectively means that 70% of our youth are either unemployed or underemployed. That is very troublesome. I know that for most of you students, being an university is significantly linked to your employability and your own economic aspirations, as well as social aspirations too. Most of you do not come to the university, spend time in Wuhan, simply for the love of an academic activity, even though that also is a good reason to pursue an education. You all often identify your future and consider university education a means to a necessary phase of your lives being economically and socially viable members of society. That was the case for the registrar I mentioned earlier in my intro, Eti Kuru. It is the case for those young men I met in the car park, and it surely must be the case for most of you also gathered here. Unfortunately, when we compare the world of work in the days of my former university registrar, the days of my time, and you today, one can only conclude that times have indeed changed and drastically so. Unemployment, in my opinion, is Ghana's biggest problem. The same may be said very easily for much of the rest of Africa. The African Development Bank estimates that Africa's labor force will be nearly 40% larger by 2030 than it is today. If current trends continue, only half of new labor force entrants 
will find employment. And most of these jobs will be in the informal sector where productivity and wages are known to be low. And job security for sure is almost non-existent. This implies that close to 100 million youth in Africa could be without jobs in the next 10 to 20 years. Way, way more than that in 20 years. In the next like eight years, we should actually have that happen. It's quite an awakening reminder that the era of somebody hiring you is gradually drawing to an end, if not ended. That window that people will hire you has narrowed. And it means that you need to be prepared to hire your own self in life. You need to prepare yourself to create a job for yourself. And by so doing, create some jobs for a few people as well. Ghana and Africa needs your ingenuity to thrive tomorrow. There's no Africa without a viable people. Your seniors will be expired. My seniors will expire. The future of Africa, the future of Ghana really rests with you. Ghana and Africa amidst this bleak picture needs urgently your ingenuity for it to thrive tomorrow. I am so sorry, but fate and possibly the failings of your predecessors, including myself and others before me, have thrust a huge responsibility on you. A responsibility to save tomorrow's Ghana and tomorrow's Africa. Daunting as it may sound, you can, but most importantly, you must know that you must. Because you have no other option for survival than to be viable, economically productive, and impactful. That's why the fact that we may have failed you, we still owe it to you to help save the generations after you. And that is why I'm happy to be spending time with you this evening, your time and afternoon, my time. I'll touch on the disruption of the fourth industrial revolution, which I'm pretty sure you are more accustomed to than I ever have been. Your pursuit of viability and impact will definitely be disrupted by the fourth industrial revolution, positively or negatively dependent on where you choose to stand. The emergence of the fourth industrial revolution that is expected to be dominated by artificial intelligence, robotics, blockchain, nanotechnology, quantum computing, augmented reality, and similar disruptive technologies is bound to make the world move faster and seem smaller than ever before. The technologies that are in development today will in the very near future force us to throw most of today's jobs into a pit of obsolescence. There will be little need for human hands in most workplaces. For example, we are going to drive around in driverless cars and lecturers can use holograms to deliver their lessons even if they are far away in the South Pole or somewhere where Alaska, and they should be able to lecture in China, somewhere in China and lecture here at this time, just with holograms. Brick and mortar financial institutions will soon be a thing of the past, as there are some banks operating in the world today with no branches whatsoever. I'm pretty sure you must have seen some in China. In the West, you see the likes of Tangerine, a bank without a branch, everything, is digital, everything is virtual. All these point to the fact that our world has changed a lot and continues to change extremely fast. But with every change comes opportunities and challenges. So the question, where do you stand? Newer opportunities will be on earth with access to more markets provided the technologies leverage to improve consumer solutions and experiences. It is a necessary condition 
that it engages, for, I mean, it is a necessary condition for an economy to optimize its potential, for its labor to be fully engaged within its own production function. I hope I'm not talking too much economics at this point. As a country desirous of being a first world country someday, employment for the Ghanaian youth cannot and must not be considered a privilege nor a social necessity. Absolutely not. At all, at all, at all, at all. It shouldn't be a privilege for you to work. At all, it is your right to work. It is your responsibility to work. For Ghana to optimize its potential, it needs its people to be employed. New opportunities amidst all these things we see in the revolution will be on earth with access to more markets provided the technology is leveraged to improve consumer solutions as I indicated earlier. So Ghanaian professionals like engineers, IT consultants and architects will be able to attend to their clients as well, efficiently anywhere in the world without travel. What we're saying here is the opportunities and challenges that the fourth industrial revolutions bring trigger an opportunity for you to turn around this bleak picture I may have painted. Your employment, like I said, should never be a privilege. It is a social necessity. It is an economic imperative. We must all realize that putting our youth to productive work sustainably is a necessary part of our country's ability to survive, compete, and thrive in the future. The skills of you, our youth, must therefore be positioned to make you viable in today's world and competent in the present tomorrow's world. I see the viability of um, every you driven by four factors. I choose to represent with the model which we may call the viability spy card, a spy card. So that possibly takes us to I don't know if my screen has been shared, you can see it. Yes, please, we can see it. Let's see, oh, sorry. Okay, since you can see it. So you see the card, I call it the viability spy card. So I'll start and probably highlight the sociocultural factors, asking what really makes you viable and competitive going forward. One, sociocultural factors, and with this I'm referring to the sociocultural frame that shapes your own broad worldviews, your values, your attitudes, And the things that often drive these are uh, generally our upbringing, our social norms, the observations we make, the models we choose in life, the religious influences that we welcome. And any of this could negatively or positively affect the character that we have. The policy factors within the span refer to the broader governance and economic environment that is supposed to stimulate employment opportunities and make it conducive for you to be employed or economically viable. The education factors, your formal education, your informal education, the technical trainings and skills required for your viability. You need to have something to give. You give nothing, you get nothing. So you invest in something to be able to give something and that's what you do through education. The why is the you factor. Simply you, your own resolve, your commitment, and your verve to thrive. These four things are referred to as the spy cards. And these are the viability cards that I believe 
as youth, we all, and, and as a country, in our policy frame, we definitely need to focus on in making sure that our people are viable in this future of work. If all these factors are effective, you should be relatively assured of your economic viability. Unfortunately, I cannot say that this that is the case for you today. Honestly, I don't think it is the case for you because these four factors don't seem to be effective. Successive occurrences of policy failures, poor governance, corruption, loss of a culture of meritocracy, many wrong examples of what success means, misplaced values, low quality education, suboptimal parenting, characterize today's spike height. So the weakness in our spike height today has made the effectiveness of our spike height weak. So today I have a different proposition to you. I wish to propose to you a new viability card. And that card is the U card. The U spy card. I use spy kites, not because it's a geometric possibility, but <laughs> simply because it's an actual necessity. You cannot be flying in the air as a kite, <laughs> but you really need a use spy kite to survive as we proceed. So as indicated earlier, your generation has no choice than to succeed. And as is often said, necessity is the matter of invention. So this new kite has one redefining factor. You, you need to own your own spy kite. You need a new you, a super you to define for yourself what is needed to thrive in the present future. So no more education. Now it is you education. All those factors that we put in place in the spike kite I presented earlier must now have must now have to be prefixed, prefixed with you. So the you education, I'll share with you my perspective on what the you education is. You have to choose to go beyond the limitations of your education. If your lectures are not practical enough, go and inquire about the alternatives and do it. If your lecturers maintain a disconnect with industry and up to train you with outdated technology or software, you don't have to wait for them. Hopefully, you don't have that in China. It's okay for you to know more than your lecture. The world is not waiting for you, so you must not wait for anyone, including your lecturers. The World Economic Forum, in its job reports, shares perspectives on what skills are required for the present future and beyond. It lists the following skills as the top 10 skills the world places need today and in the not too distant future. One, analytical thinking and innovation. Two, active learning and learning and uh, active learning and learning strategies. Three, complex problem solving. Four, critical thinking and analysis. Five, creativity, originality, and initiative. Six, leadership and social influence. Seven, technology use, monitoring, and control. Technology design and program. Nine, resilience, stress, tolerance, and flexibility. And the last one, reasoning, problem solving and ideation. Remember the word ideation. I find this list very interesting because I consider all these skills to be intricately connected and not mutually exclusive in any form. In other words, you need to possess all these skills at once, even if in varying degrees of competence. How do you solve problem, complex problems without critical thinking or creativity? It's impossible. 
How do you effectively lead people without social influence or emotional intelligence? How do you effectively negotiate without judgment, decision making, and cognitive flexibility? Two things are therefore clear to me. First, the thriving workforce of the future must be completely skilled and prepared to be able to compete effectively. And secondly, the permeating future of all the skills, in my opinion, is creativity. You remember the word ideation. How do you generate ideation without creativity? Key to the viability of the skills enumerated by the World Economic Forum are the basic skills required of a graduate today. These include communication, oral and written, as well as presentation, effective IT skills at the use of what you basically know. But it is disappointing that these days, unfortunately, sometimes for us here, hiring a graduate sometimes meaning, means hiring somebody who will struggle to put together a simple letter or to put together a simple invitation to a meeting or even run basic averages with Excel. It is an unforgivable thing that you can maneuver yourself effectively around the Microsoft Office suite or any other productivity suites. It is totally unacceptable that a modern graduate will struggle with typesetting in Microsoft Word. If you are not good at it, please go to the internet and edit it. After all, you're in China. I believe none of you uh, are may fall into this category. A few things I charge you. No, in the development of you and the you education. While you spend your time in China, stop learning just to pass your exams. Learn more to know more and learn how to learn and know. The world will change faster than before and you must be quick to adapt. Okay. Learn new things, unlearn old things and relearn. Possibly half of the things you learn today may be irrelevant in the future. But when you learn how to learn, you'll always be up to date. Number two, Learn to speed read and read critically. The poor reading culture we have in Ghana, which I'm sure some of you are already trapped in, including myself, will only lead you to failure and economic hardship. You must quickly acquire knowledge and make better meaning of information better than any robot. You have the advantage of wisdom and humanity to outdo any robot. As they say, a strong answer and a strong dream. The third thing I'd advise you is that you should be very flexible in, in, in your thoughts and views. Flexibility is key. In other words, be open minded. The road approach and regimented nature of our education system in Ghana will render you obsolete. So please, while you're in China, don't carry that one there. If you don't break free, and realize that in a fast changing world, ideas are not static and that methods are bound to change. Um, you over time have no choice than to adapt to the changing times because change will change you. So please be creative in your thinking and be open to new ways and creative ideas. A fourth one on your youth education is this. Learn how to code. Coding is the English and maths of the future. I don't know how to code, but even as I sit, I feel it's deficient. Your time could be worse. So on this matter, may I be the also for do what I say and not what I do. But coding is the English and maths of the future. I'll now go to the you social culture. Remember the social culture fa factor. And as I said, we're now going to prefix everything with you, with the new spy card. While skills are important, it is our attitudes and values that bring them to life on any job. These include curiosity, 
excellence, responsibility, accountability, integrity, candor, confidence, hard work, respect for time, attention to detail, meritocracy, ownership, and I repeat, ownership. And my favorites, good citizenship and a recognition that we must focus on effects and not efforts. Owning your own sociocultural factor requires you to scan the right attitudes, values, virtues, and broad worldviews for your own success. It requires you to not seek others to imbibe them in you. It requires you to take your destiny into your own hands and pursue the attitudes you need to thrive. For example, you should desire, decide and, and, and resolve not to be late irrespective of how normal it is in Ghana. Your competition in the present future is not Ghana, it is the world. If people can have meetings through holograms and feel like they are present, then you let you know that the people you are competing with are global. If an IT firm sitting in China can sit here and take charge of my laptop and fix anything that's on my computer, it should tell you that you're not competing with Ghanaians, you're competing with the world. If an accountant sitting somewhere in the US can be booking and managing my entry, preparing my books, providing advice on how we should spend, spending time doing that with Zoom, with other software, tell me, who do you think you're competing with? If people can get that service better, from people outside of your jurisdiction, they will go for it. So your competition is no more God. It's no more your classroom in China, but it is the world. So please decide to be meticulous, even when you find no immediate reward in it. I'll tell you, coming into this uh, meeting, I had a conversation with, uh, with uh, Michael, your colleague Michael. We had initially, had initially agreed to have it down with your original date, which was, I think, uh, two weeks ago on Friday. And that day comes and we were all over the place with the arrangement. I was prepared. The next thing happens. We said, okay, let's have it done two weeks from that Friday, which is supposed to be the coming Friday. So I have locked it in my head that is two weeks before, by then. So he will send the details and agree the topic, all that, blah, blah, blah. Now, Michael sends me the flyer for today's session. And on it is 23rd February. But I did not see it because I wasn't meticulous. Because I'd logged it in my mind that Friday 25th would be the date. So what Michael said, I was just looking at the topics and the name correct, and I said, yeah, it's fine. Michael took the name prompt. He calls me today, three hours ago, and reminds me that we have our session at 1 p.m. my time. Now, guess what has happened? I was preparing for Friday this afternoon because I wasn't meticulous. I was caught slightly on our way. But Michael, I'll give you credits. You did the proper follow-up. But put that in a real life or business situation. You are not meticulous. This could have been a wonderful investment opportunity I may have thrown away simply because I wasn't meticulous. So please, decide to be meticulous even when you find no immediate reward in it because it has to be a culture you have. Like I said, the things we needed to survive in our time are different from the things you need to survive in your time. Your times are going to be more complicated, more difficult than the ones we are going through. The next thing, please, decide to be honest and uphold integrity whether there are immediate benefits to it or not. Decide to work with passion and commitment irrespective of the reward you get. In that process, you'll be building a better you to optimize your own future. You can't act your whole life. 
but you can be you your whole life. So invest in things that make you be a good you. And it comes from practicing, not practicing it for reward, but practicing it for it. In my office, you dare not tell me you sent that mail. You better let me know that you got a feedback needed for our decision making. The world actually rewards effect and not effort. Today, more than ever, the world has little room for those who have nothing to show but effort. You have been trying and trying and trying. Yeah, it's good to try. But you need to win. You need to win. So I'll share something with you about the world of work, the kinds of people we get. So the story goes that an employer was accused by one of his managers. According to this manager, Kojo, the employer, had overlooked him for promotion in favor of Aku. Kojo alleged that his boss was partial and used tribal prejudice in determining who got promoted. He even suggested that somebody was a certain party or did that the same party. That's why he didn't get a promotion. The employer actually empathized with the hurt expressed by Kojo but denied the allegation of the bias. He said, Kojo, it's not true. I feel your pain that you're not promoted, but it's not true. So you know what? Go and call Aku for me. He goes to call Aku. Aku comes. Then the employer asks Kojo to check out the price of an HP laptop from the Accra mall. And then ask Aku, to go do the same at the West Hills Mall. Both of them returned at the same time. Kojo reported that there was no HP laptop at the Accra Mall with the specifications indicated by the employer. So he came back with the money. For her part, Aku reported that the exact specifications the employer wanted were absent, but she had checked online and realized that she could get the same computer that the, the, the employer wanted at the ASC mall. And for similar specifications, but for a different brand, she could also get the laptop at Oxford Street in Osu. She ran the employer through a certain comparative analysis on price and warranty and after sales service policies. She said, that, look, if you buy from ANC Mall, all right, this one comes with a six month warranty. But when you go here, even though it is Dell and not HP, you may be able to get two years. This guy has a certain proven track record. When we look at the customer service ratings and the referrals online, this one has better reviews than this guy. And she tells them about the payment terms. Some have full money back. After Aku's presentation, you can imagine the room was quiet. The employer asked Aku to leave the meeting. Then he turned to Kojo, do I need to say anything else? Kojo just went and came back to say what he wanted was not there. Aku went and came back and said, what you wanted was not there, but there are other places to get it, or there are other options we can have. These are the terms, these are the analysis of it. So you tell me, guys, who will you want to employ, Kojo or Aku? You tell me, who are you? Are you a Kojo or are you an Aku? So please seek to effect and stop showing effort. Be prepared to hire yourself. Stop being a taker and be a maker. Give something to the world. Let the world remember you for something you made. If you aim to make and give something to the world, you'll be focused on delivering it and you will have little time to waste on things that don't matter. You will spend far less time on social media. Whenever you are tempted to cyber slack on social media, remember that kids in Singapore, India, China, Germany, and other countries are preparing to make you their taker. So question, you want to be a maker or a taker? Furthermore, remember that in the abundance of time, 
there is no time. I see some of you looking quite young, and this is a great time in life, but in the abundance of time, remember, there is no time. So I touch on the most important, no, the next one before the most important. The EU policy in the spiker, in the new spiker. Do not be passive about the policy environment. Investing in being aware of the opportunities that are there in the general policy environment is important. The opportunities they bring and the challenges inherent in all these policy frames is something you must take an interest in. It will be important in your own planning. Do not be aloof about policy making. Oh, I'm not a politician. Nobody's asking for you to come and do NDC MPP. But you need to understand what the policies are, what opportunities are, what the debates are, what the weaknesses are, and identify, use that information, information to help define your own sweet spot. You can't be aloof about policy. You must definitely let your voice be heard. For the future is yours and our policy decisions today must set you up right for tomorrow. So I humbly appeal to you, do not get trapped in the illogical nuances of our partisan politics and do not seek to make your living from politics. Rather be interested in positioning, in the positioning of policy irrespective of your political persuasions and understand that to make politics your livelihood rather than a call to service is akin to setting yourself up to be a glorified thief. I beg you, I've been a student politician before. This is time for you to nurture yourself for economic viability. In your engagements as Luke's Wuhan, your focus should be how the policies shape the opportunities you would have. Because whether it's NDC or MPP that runs this country, I don't think any of you wants to go hungry. I don't think any of you wants to go unemployed. I don't think any of you want to go homeless. So you should spend your energy on how policy helps the youth and make your voice be heard. Add your voice in shaping the trajectory of our country because you will inherit the effects of our dealings today. And now to the most important. You need to be a super you. So I call this the you, you, the double you. You need to be a resilient you, one committed to thriving, building a strong verb to win. The biggest value you can have is you in the you kite. Like I tell people every day, value begets value. From something comes something. So understand that you are of value and in a world that rewards only value, you are the primary route to your own success. So please believe in yourself, irrespective of your background irrespective of your failings or the bleakness others see in you. You are here now and you have no option than to move into tomorrow. As we speak, you are in China, you're already moving to tomorrow faster than myself. So please believe in yourself, stand up, invest right in your education. In you, invest right in you acquiring the right social and sociocultural skills and values, right attitudes, Learn about policy. Make your voice surely be heard and always know that, yes, you can. So I'll wrap up with my little story. I don't come from a flamboyant background. I have been homeless. I'm sure many of you may have seen heard my story about me being a baker. Yes, I had to be to navigate my path through university education. I used to be teased and loved by my friends every now and then because I went to a proper site.
But as one thing I was clear, I was me. And once I was me, I had to invest and try to be the best of me. And in pursuing that, I held my own, optimized the opportunities that came, and I fought for every ground and space. I can't or I could not be where I am if for status, I could not invest and believe in myself. So the biggest gift you have is you. So never let go of you. Believe in yourself and invest in yourself by acquiring the knowledge, knowledge and skills, the attitudes you need to complete your new spike and ensure viability and sustainability for yourself. And in that process, you'll be doing that for Ghana and Africa as a whole. Thank you. Madam MC, I'm done. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Senor. Thank you very much. This was very, very, very educative. I actually took three things. He said your employment is a social necessity and not a privilege. Of yes, and the permeative future of all skills is actually creativity. Yeah, and yes, yes. A abundance of time, there is actually no time. And these three things really got to me. Thank you very much for having you today, also honoring our call. Okay, so we would now like to take questions. So if you have any, if you have any question, kindly raise your hand and Honorable is here to answer you. Can you let me see your hand and I'll call you? I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not honorable. I'm just senior. Senior is okay. my name, not honorable. <laughs> uh, we, we all have to start, start stopping making things go out of politics. Politicians who are supposed to serve us. Even though I'm not a politician, you should be able to call them by their name. Joe Biden is Joe Biden. Everybody shouts and screams, see it, abide. Even though he's in it, he was in it, abide. So let this be. Just refer to me as senior. All right, Mr. Senior, thank you very much. So please let me see your hand if you have any question. And kindly make it brief since our time is fast spent. Just a little note, I'm just stepping up to pick up coffee. I can hear you. There's enough sound here. So please just carry on while I just get my espresso. All right. Okay. Um, Mr. Emmanuel Echampo, can I please hear you? Or can he please hear your question? Hello, am I audible? Yes. Please, you can go on. Hello. Okay, then Alan Zero can go on with his question. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. So you can please unmute yourself and then ask your question. All right, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my good name evening. is David Alan Zero from Johnson University. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Jose uh, for the, the lecture. Um, in fact, I, I used to work with, uh, with Dominion, so um, I was the sector before I came to China. So. Um, I'm quite cognizant. I know him very well, so thank you, sir. Um, by the way, I want to know how, how we're doing, the sector is doing now, the BDCs. How Which we sector? Doing? The BDC sector, the BDCs. How are we doing? Uh, different times, but I think it will be fine, one step at a time. All right. And okay. uh, you, you already know the issues with petroleum and prices, so some of have major implications of credits and trying to squeeze in or tighten a bit of supply. It'll be fine. We'll be here all week. 
All right, thanks. So um, my question is just has to do with, um, um, I just got about some tricky takeaways. That's the first one is to be, uh, to be prepared to be your own employer, you know. In fact, I, I just, um, I believe that those of us in China here, we have the opportunity to learn from China because China is an industrial hub of the world. And so those of us school in China, we have the opportunity to, uh, even as we study, to look around, to see what we can do, um, to learn something that if we go back home, uh, we could yeah. employ people instead of seeking for jobs. Already the unemployment rate in Ghana is so, so high that all of us cannot go and be uh, job seekers. We need to go and create jobs. So that is a very important point. I think that I, I believe that we must all take that into consideration, uh, even as we study here. But I was expecting that um, Sonia would have spoken a little about the energy sector because that is a sector that you know most of us don't have ideas about. So if I mean we could have spoken about how the in terms of job opportunities and how we can create jobs in that sector. Because as I'm here, I've already picked up uh, one or two ideas that I think that if I come to Ghana and I want to uh, look at that sector, you know, you could be of help in terms of the transport aspect. You know, um, you know. Either you want to be uh, to work as uh, to own the OMC or whatever you want to do in Ghana. I mean, there are other jobs that we can do at that downstream sector that can create jobs for ourselves and our younger brothers or our fellow Ghanaians. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm quite excited about the presentation. In fact, it has become a cliche that uh, we shouldn't, uh, in terms of the qualities that we need to have as, as individuals, because uh, looking for a job, I don't, I don't think that should be our mentality as, as of now. And the youth politics is not something that we should we should shy away from, because politics shape our lives. You know, uh, if 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 we if if we don't engage in politics, someone else will engage in this and then pass policies and laws that will not benefit us. But we need to play politics that will benefit us. You know, uh, of course, Senyu made a statement like glorified thieves, but I don't think that uh, it was just a statement. But uh, it is good to be a politician because if you do not if you don't take part. As I stated earlier, on someone else will take part and do things that you don't like. So we must actively participate. You know, China has done something that I think that we, those from the developing world, must learn from China. We're in China here. Yeah, we've seen some phenomenal developments. You know, things that China have done. Uh, we we kind of wonder how come that China has done that so far, uh, yet we have not developed as China has done. So we need to just look at in terms of the social aspect of developments. The you know how the country. It is being run. So those of us, if we go to take up uh, political positions, we, we also run our country in the same manner. So it is not bad for us to, to aspire to go to politics. But when you go, we must change the game. It mustn't be the old game that's been played in Ghana. Because like, I feel that uh, uh, politics is not helping us so much, of course, but it doesn't mean it's not good. It's just that we need to play in a different way so that we can develop our country much faster than as it is now. We've not developed as we aspire to. So I'm very impressed with the lecture. Uh, but of course, uh, when I come to Ghana, I'll come and see you. I want to be my own employer. If, if you can employ me, I hope I can get a job. You know, I mean, I can, I can employ myself as, as, as uh, you know, a transporter in the future. So thank you, sir. So book my name, then when I come to Ghana, I'll come to see you, sir. Please do hear me. Yeah. I don't interrupt, but because of our time, if you could just summarize everything for us. Oh, oh, okay. It, that is all. I've, I've ended my, my presentation. It was just some comment, but I don't have any question per se, but just to um, also comment on what Senyo has said. So thanks. thanks. Okay. Yeah. All right. So Alam Zero, just a quick response to. All right. Okay. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't go into politics. I'm saying at your stage, you shouldn't seek to make a living out of politics. We are a developing country. Politics should be a call to service. And it's a service that would hardly be. I don't think most of our politicians can justify their livelihoods with the income that they have. So my encouragement to young people, don't make politics your next job. Yeah, top priority. Build a career, yeah. build a career invest in economic productivity and sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can serve. You can serve politics has to be done. So I haven't said that you shouldn't go to politics. I'm saying don't seek to make a living out of politics. Out of politics. At your yes. stage right now, you need to make a living for yourself, for yeah. the country. 
And I think that can be done. And politics is not the focus that you should have immediately. But issues of policy must be something you must have optimum interest in and make your voice be heard, be counted. Because what we do or not do may wrongly affect your own prospects as a, as a, as a productive citizen. That's right. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have a lot of pens raised here, but I don't think we can take care of everyone. So I think the next person is supposed to be Emmanuel Echampo. Can we please hear you? Hello, Emmanuel Echampo. Okay, let's move to, um, I can't really see the name well, but then the person is a co-host. Can we please hear you? I think it's Seton Nation. Oh, yeah. Can I please? You can please unmute your mic and ask your question. Hello, can I be heard? Seto, can yeah, you? Thank you very much, uh, Honorable. Um, Royalty, uh, thank you very much for the moderation. And I would like to thank Mr. Senior Hossi for a wonderful presentation, which has been very inspiring this evening. Though time factor had not been on the site, but he was able to sacrifice to be here with us. Really appreciate the effort. Um, no waste of much time. I'll just go straight to my question. And I have two questions. Uh, Mr. Senior Hossi, please. Um, as an agriculturist and someone who is into rice farming, would you yes. advise the youth to go into agriculture? And if yes, do you think the government subventions that are being given are good enough? And what are some of the bottlenecks and challenges that you have encountered through your agriculture um, endeavor? And the second question is in relation to the economy. As an economic analyst, I would like to seek your view in relation to the current issues within our country when it comes to how well our economy is faring and the Moody's downgrading Ghana and with the issue of um, now all we hear is that each and every politician is telling us that uh, now the E-Levy is the cure to every problem within our country. And as an economic analyst, what's your take on that? Do you think that uh, implementing the E-Levy would help uh, salvage our economy in reference to the CD depreciation? And then uh, when it comes to the bulk oil distribution, yeah. thank you very much. Okay, so Seto, your question is loaded. So let me okay, let me deal with the great. The support for agriculture is not great. That's the honest fact. Um, as you, I would ask you to hasten slowly coming into agriculture. One of the biggest problems we have with agriculture is information and data to be able to guide you on how to build your business slowly. Don't jump to one run to do a farm. Invest very progressive because you need to learn. I've been at it for seven years, for five years. So I'm still learning. I've been making losses. I'm breaking even practically from last season for the first time. And agri is quite a high capital intensive space. But you could start slowly by looking at supply chain. You may not have so much money. So the question is, which part of the chain could I fit in? Could I be a distributor of the produce? Could I lift and rather facilitate markets? Could I handle logistics? Could I just look for an input supply? Or do I just start with a smaller garden and then learn the agronomy pretty well away from what is started, blah, blah, blah. So when I start, I don't get bent so quickly. 
So I would always advise you to visit this room and come into our group. Our group is critical. This is the future. Whatever it is, we all eat. Whatever it is, we all drink water. Whether we like it or not, IT will control almost everything. So these three things are going to be part of the future. Taking a decision to fit into that future is not a wrong one. But you have to take that decision carefully so you don't actually lose steam too early. Now, on the issue about e level I think it's very responsible for anybody to want to now suggest that without e level this country comes to an end. It's not a proper thing. I think it's, it's actual, actually some kind of blackmail. And I wouldn't encourage policymakers to, to really make that call. But there's a reason why, I mean, the, the revenue of e, e levy is, 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 is critical, you know, but there are ways to really create a balance. The sensitivities of the public are clear. It makes very little moral sense for you to want to be dipping your hands into people's pockets, people's wallets, all right, when they've actually paid their taxes. It also makes sense for government to want to go and get people to pay their taxes, possibly through the, the, um, the, the current uh, digital, digital system that they have. So there's a balance that we can create between what the public seem to, to stand for and what government is seeking to achieve. Government is seeking to achieve a certain, a certain fiscal, fiscal, fiscal space. It wants to plug a certain fiscal hole. There's no doubt about it. But some of these must start with good leadership. What's the example that government is showing? That things are difficult, we need to tighten our belt. Yes, we need to tighten our belt. But is government showing sign that it is also tightening its belt? These are times for a radical change in our approach to things. So one, it is not the case that the Ghana is going to end because e levy is not passed. e levy has not been passed. They plan to have e levy passed at the beginning, uh, effective 1st of February. Today is what? 23rd. It's likely we are going to end the month without e -Lev. Ghana hasn't died. Are things difficult? Yes, things are difficult. Are there options? Possibly some other options. Our current tax system can be optimized. There are lots of leakages. If e -Lev passes and government gets that revenue, it's fine for government. All right? It may not be great for the people, but it may be fine for government. But if the e -Lev is not going to be passed, there are other options we should be looking at. Our expenditure must be rationalized. In a country so broke, it makes no sense that we actually have 275 parliamentarians. It makes no sense that we are actually keeping over 100, what, 110 or so, or 11, I forgot even the numbers now, ministers. What are we doing scaling back? It makes no sense that we are appointing deputy CEOs in different places where we have no need for deputy CEOs. There are technocrats out there. We create all kinds of expenditure in our 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 in our uh, in, 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 within our fiscal space, and we all turn around and start complaining about the absence of, 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 of fiscal space. You look at our procurement systems. We look at the amount of wasted and corruption that happens sometimes across the chain. We are doing very little. We are doing very little on that part. So I mean, I, I'm sorry, but I, I just think it is irresponsible for anybody. To want to start blackmailing the public and suggest that without e levy, you can't get road contractors paid. Without e levy, then why did you give them the contract? And you see, this is the government that has been running this place for five years. So when we say this, what are we saying about the government itself? So I encourage government and appointees make the case for the need for fiscal space. Show example that you are having fiscal discipline and you can engage the public properly. That is how we deal with the space of policy. But when we deal with it this way, I say we don't care about the sensitivity of the people. No, it's not a very great balance. Honest, it's not a great balance. I, I mean, right now, very since as if you can't marry without e levy. Uh, your girlfriends cannot visit you anymore because of e levy. Without e levy, your girlfriends will come. It's not right. It's not the kind of language we should be encouraging in our country. We should let people understand why. There are good things in the e levy policy. 
They're trying to encourage people to pay taxes. So they say, look, if you're actually collecting money and you are, you are, it's for the purchase of a good, and that person who's receiving the money for the purchase of a given good is a registered taxpayer, that person is not going to be charged a D level. That is a good thing. So it would rather encourage people to go and register. But how about the individual that you are sending money to? That pays his taxes. Can we rather rationalize and create room for that? How about a bank to bank transaction? Can we rationalize that? There are good things in there. But when we box it together, and rather instead of us making people know that we need to encourage, encourage tax compliance in our country and make that the reason, and if need that government needs revenue, and we're rather enforcing tax discipline, tax compliance. Other than trying to make it seem as though we can't breathe again with that elect, I don't think that communication is right. And it is absolutely wrong. If we tighten the space as is today, the truth is we'll be able to cover a good part of what we currently have. Anyway, I, I don't know who tempted me to talk about Inebi. I haven't spoken about Inebi anyway. God forgive you, whoever you are. So, uh, Seto, I hope to see you in Ghana when you are back in, the, in, in town. Yeah. Uh, I'll be around. Over the, uh, <laughs> Thank you have, very much. You have led that neighbor into temptation. Uh, God forgive you. Uh, over to you, Madam MC, Royalty. There are a few hands up if you want to call them. Yeah. All right. So I would like to take Ebenezer and Exinique, but please spare us with the appreciation and the greetings and other stuff because we are far, far behind time. So just go straight to your question and please ask only one question. It might not be okay, maybe cut you yeah. short. So only one question uh, now. Uh... Okay, let me make it snappy because I was I was hoping that with what is going on, and what uh, our, our, our CEO has said, we here can represent or present or prepare ourselves like the Ghanaian Parliament, and every now and then when an issue comes up in Ghana, we can come yes. together and discuss it, and see yes. the way forward. It's a way for us preparing ourselves to take up leadership role. So I'll be looking for it for it. But then my main question is, um, I'm going to dwell on, I'm believing he's the same man who, whose video we've shared the whole of this week, speaking at the 70th anniversary of the Ghana uh, Business School, this thing. I feel you, I feel you, wow, denche, denche. But then this has been my question for a long time. I've seen that there's been a vast variation, a very big gap between the education system and the employment world. And it's been my worry. And that has created a lot of unemployment, just like you are saying. What are you, the entrepreneurs, the business people, doing to inform this uh, uh, educational institution to be able to incorporate what you need, the expertise and the technicalities you need into our education system? Because it looks like I left Ghana and in the no time, everybody is establishing a university. But I wonder if they have a link with you, the entrepreneurs, the industries and the business asking what you really need in order to produce a working and a skill this thing. Because I see a lot of Mokala women there, business graduates coming out and they have no modules to produce for these Mokala women to be able to even manage their small, small businesses. So I hope you understand my question. Thank you very much. Okay, so Joe, um, uh, your name again, sir? Um, Eben, Ebenezer. Eben, okay. So Eben, I, 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 from, uh, from my knowledge, they're very weak or none. Uh, very little coordination cooperation with industry. So you see, the children that are in, the, in, the, in secondary school today, in another, oh, let me, let's take, let's, let's start from GSS. In another seven years, they, they are supposed to be in, in the university. 
They'll spend four years investing, so 11 years. They should be out of the invest or some tertiary institution. So with good policy making, what we should be doing is that the education we are giving the person who is now going to GSS 1, to be able to equip him progressively for the type of skills that you need in 10 years time, 11 years time. You understand? So all through this time, we are preparing him so that by the time he leaves university, he has all the skills he needs to really work in that time. That forward thinking is not there. And when I discussed this at the university, I asked them, now what's the plan for the fourth industrial revolution? There are certain skills that you need when you get out of university in the next four years. So we should know how the person should be educated. But to get that, you need proper interaction with industry. You need proper research into work needs of the future. So you schedule your, your education program, the syllabus and everything to fit that. But we seem to be living always in the past. It is impossible that a, a, a responsible society would have graduates who come out today and have limited computer skills. It's not acceptable. So that coordination is not there. Well, we are also investing in soft skills and not just in hard technical skills, i.e. one plus one is equal to two. But one plus one is equal to two, you must know how to communicate it. So you can inspire people to act properly. So we have a huge gap. There's, there's, a, there's, there's, there's a disconnect between industry's needs and education. I am not aware of a constructive effort to really bridge that gap. How many of you here have your universities follow up on you? I mean, your Ghana universities follow up on you on how you are faring, what your situations are, what are the experiences that you think um, you are having that you should have had in school? Has anybody been receiving any mails like that, a call from your, your, your former universities? We call these tracer studies. Has anybody done that? Has anybody reached out to any of you? Okay, I see a no. So no, it's, the, it's like that. It's they, a no, it's they, a big they, no, for real. It's a big no. No, it, tell, it tells you when somebody has started work, a university, a very serious university should be reaching out to know that you've left the school. Have you got a job? Know and take, take, make a survey and see whether the, your skills leaving the job was adequate I mean, for you to really excel on your job. Are there gaps in it? What is it that you think you should have known before getting in there? You should have an interaction with your HR. And then go back and remodel education. The ideal thing is that you should be talking to your HR on how to prepare the people who will come out in the next three years or four years and start preparing them now. So by the time they come, that HR person should, should be happy to have them. Where is the connect? None. But trust me, most of our lecturers who are going to all these Cambridges and Harvard, they are, they, those universities are in constant touch with them. So I just, I just don't know how we miss the plot because they have the experience, but they deliver it not to our people. And that's why my boom, but I hope that we are learning and then we are all going to adapt properly. You know, I have school fully in Ghana, so my situation is my situation. Thank you. Uh, honorable, just a follow up. I'm believing I'm not it's honorable. about time. I'm believing it's about time you guys mount pressure on them for our sake. Please. Because if you, 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 the top executives who are well known, what you started at the University of Ghana created hope for, for some of us. So I'm believing we should have such more. That is the only way they are going to listen. Because when we come for Modi Mumbrof, we'll send no Baba Hayoha. But when you guys who are there, they know the productive work you are doing, mount on them and telling them what they are doing is right, they will see that, hey, where they are, they will listen. So we have hope, honorable, we are looking at you guys. Please help us. 
I, I hear you. We try small, but in this town, it's very difficult. After this submission and lecture, I'm going to be in trouble by tomorrow morning. So uh, it, it makes a lot of people cow. And, and and yes, a very few of us sometimes there to be CEO activists, but we have to give a voice to our youth. We have to set the state rights for their future. As things stand, things are really bad. And I'm really worried, heavily perturbed, but it shall be well. Let's keep pushing the boundaries. Okay, thank you. Please, I would like to read a question from the chat box. Someone says, say, someone yeah. with much interest in the agri sector, what would your opinion on the cannabis industry? We know how huge this industry is. Would it not be beneficial looking at the geographical location of Ghana to be a hub for growing cannabis in Africa. South Africa is making so much foreign exchange from this. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I think that we should be producing things consumers need and that's healthily sustainable. And if the cannabis industry is rife, is legal, is sustainable, is needed. And we have the ability to open a different part of our economy to the production of cannabis. I think it should be done. And it should be done in a very regulated fashion. The world is changing. The things that created employment yesterday are not necessarily the things that are going to create employment today or tomorrow. So if there is the opportunity for us to jump into the tomorrow, we must move. I'm not a I'm not a, 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 a weed uh, um, smoker. I have never smoked it in my life. In my adult life, it took me to get to about the age of 26 to actually witness what weed was like. You know, I would have walked past it without even knowing. But that is a resource the world needs. The world is allowed to have it. The world is allowed to have it. And that resource can be produced out of here. I think we should be able to start looking at ways to regulate it and make sure it is not abused. I mean, just like anything, if controls and regulations are not in place properly, it will be abused to the detriment of society. We're not making cannabis openly done in a regulated fashion has not stopped people from smoking cannabis. It has not stopped people from producing cannabis. So why don't we rather face up to the reality, open up the sector, demystify the sector, and regulate it properly for economic productivity, not just for us, um, not just for, for consumption in Ghana, but more for the world. I, I don't think that there should be any hesitation over this matter. If it was an illegal thing, cocaine is illegal, so we can't be producing coca. So that is not a subject for conversation. But when the world has legalized it and the world wants it, if we don't think we should have it here, at least produce it for the world and collect your money. And then create jobs in your country. But this has to be done. It definitely has to be done. Dubai is a Muslim country, but it doesn't stop alcohol from being sold at the airport. Because those are the things that make the tourists come. The tourists want the beer. The tourists want the whiskeys. So they make sure you have it, but they regulate where you can have it and, and how you can have it. Because what they want is the tourists to come. So we also want something. We want a certain economic productivity. We've been growing weed in this world country for a long time. And if we can rather make it a stimulator for economic productivity and boom, we should do it and create hope and the future for our, our youth. It's my opinion. All right, thank you very much, Asenio. Okay, I would like to take an Pa, and before that, kindly stick to the time. Do not ask more than one question, and also do not ask a follow-up question. Enesda Pa, can I please hear you? Can we hear you? Sorry. Um, yes, please, thank you. Um, I want to ask um, a question. 
how do you push through your worst times? We know that um, in a moment of crisis, when things seem to be mostly falling apart, followers tend to its leaders for a sense of reassurance. So how do you push through your worst times? I look at my daughter, I look at my son, I look at the kids on the streets, and I have every reason to push on. I have every reason to put myself together. Because life is not just about us, it's about the impact we can make on others other than us. So when I go through my rough times, my difficult times, I go through my own feelings, it's a wake up call to rise up and even work harder for the good of others too. So I take it as it comes and keep moving. Okay, my question is answered, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. And I would like to take Thompson. Can you unmute your mic and let us hear your question now? Hi, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm be I believe I'm being heard. Yes, yeah, please. Okay, um, Mr. Seyong, looking at the geographical location of our motherland, Ghana, we are in a position to win many markets in Africa, including the sale uh, of our resources such as the oil. Um, speaking from the proximity perspective, uh, as the CEO of the chambers, uh, the Chamber of Bulk and Oil Distributors, is there any distribution center that can enable Ghana to sell most of its products uh, in, 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 in fast time to the other African countries, especially the Burkina Faso, the Mali, and Co. Uh, that is one. And also being a board member of the Ghana Highway Authority, you know, road is one of Hello. the main things. Sorry, no, it's, it's, it's the same, it, it relates to the question, the first one. <laughs> yeah, far behind, I'm very sorry. Okay, Let so me. what I'm trying to say that in terms of proximity, what are we doing to make sure that our resources are being sold out to those people as quickly as possible? Well, uh, we do export products to, uh, uh, to the Sahelian countries you mentioned. What we have to do is deepen our policy framework to make that much simpler. There are a few bottlenecks, but that has always been in the works. So government is looking hard to make Ghana a better um, channel to achieve that. Uh, we hope we'll be able to get there someday also. So that work is there. But we already export to Burkina, but we are not the only ones. Uh, Benin does that. Ivory Coast that, that does that. We also have Senegal also uh, export to some of these uh, Sahelian countries. Same, same, same market. I think there are just three as of now. I think uh, Mali, uh, uh, Burkina Faso and, and a part of the jail. So that's that's it with that. All right. So I'll take the last person. That is Bill Shaw. Can I? Can we please hear your question? I I I, I have a request that you respond to Otis as well. His hands has been up for a very long time. Really, I, I have. Okay, just, I, oh yes, that's it, yeah. Keep yeah. But they all make it quick, so we can wrap it up in five minutes. Can we please hear you, Bill Shaw? Right, okay, yes, uh, uh, good presentation, sir. Uh, my, my, it's more of a submission. Um, for instance, in my school, uh, they have uh, something like uh, an innovative corner where they, where they encourage basically just the people here, the indigents, to uh, uh, come up with ideas that take part in competitions and then win funding. Uh, do you think the business world, or is it the, 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 
the CEOs or I'd say uh, the investors in Ghana are open to such uh, investments, uh, especially in our uh, college. Go ahead again. You have a you have a, 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 a an innovation corner. You say? Yeah, like in the in the school. Yeah, yeah. yeah where where the indigenous, the locals, like the Chinese uh, students, are encouraged to come up with the ideas that that compete for investments. And then uh, yeah. this, these things, uh, uh, they, they, uh, they compete for huge investments. I, I was personally involved in one. Uh, one guy invited me to just, uh, what they needed basically was to polish their business plan in terms uh, in English for a funding for the automation of a factory. And then this took part in a competition and then uh, won funding. And the way these guys behave sometimes is when it goes far, then they drop you the foreigners from the whole thing. However, I'm asking, do you think uh, this thing uh, will be supported by investors in Ghana? Um, I absolutely think that it will be supported. I mean, there's no reason. It's a matter of investment opportunities and returns. And if their work is really well packaged, I mean, you're likely going to get the right response. All right. Okay. Now, almighty Otis, you may have your shot now. All right, Otis, can All you right, please? So thank you, sir. Uh, it was just what he requested because I've noticed in Ghana we have very low venture capitalists and. Uh, you know, some might have projects and uh, uh, getting funding becomes difficult and banks are not willing uh, to support the youth, especially when they know you haven't come up with any project before. So that has been what has been running through my mind. Is there a way to uh, assess them uh, or to get help? Yes, sir. I don't think that with the, with the very new idea, I mean, the banks are actually the best. Your primary financiers any time in life are yourself through the savings you accrue with work, family and friends who can buy and believe in your vision and dream and, and bank on your own reputation and talent. So to easily just expect a bank to jump to your rescue, you must have something really pretty tight and well packaged. Banks pursue returns and capital preservation. So you have to definitely um, take your time. If it's a new idea, um, then you know that you're not going to get a bank to jump at it. Imagine you keep your money at the bank and then the bank is any new idea, somebody who is less experienced at it or hasn't got a very well structured or secure plan, the banks keep throwing their money at it. Can you imagine what will happen to you? <laughs> That's why they are venture capital funds. So banks are rational people. They act just like you. You know, who will you give your money to? What will you give your money to? They don't print money. They take your money and give to other people. Or they take other people's money and give to you. So you have to rationalize and package your business properly. Ideally, you look at venture capitalists. And that's why I say family and friends matter. When you have a good idea and you think that it can roll out. But you have to build the base your own savings. That's why you have to be working, keep money together. If you want to develop a, a, a business, remember, no people don't invest in ideas. They invest mm. in solutions and products. Remember that too. No people don't invest in ideas. Right, when you give an idea, you walk away with it. So an idea is nothing than just an idea. And remember that when you think, you're not the only one thinking. So <laughs> stop thinking as though you're the only one thinking. All right? So yeah, if you have yeah. an idea, you're not the one coming up with that idea. It's what you do with the idea. So build the groundwork. When people, you put the groundwork and, and close to proof the theory or the, or, the, or the opportunity, it becomes easier for investors to also tag or jump along. All right, so well noted, sir. yeah, there's supposed to be some balance somewhere there. All right, so thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Pleasure, pleasure, artist. Pleasure, artist. Okay, thank you all for the questions and thank you very much, Mr. Senor. Thank you very much for the presentation and everything. It's now time for citation and I would like to call the National FC, Honorable Gabriel, to give us the citation.
Okay, thank you very much, Madam MC. Good evening, everyone. Please, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Okay. And thank you very much, sir, for your great presentation and in-depth knowledge shared this evening. We are much grateful. Honorable Salam, please, can you share the screen for? Okay, citation in honor of Mr. Senior Hosi. The National Union of Ghana Students, Wuhan and Lanjo Chapters, China, wish to extend their sincere gratitude to you for availing yourself as a special guest and facilitator for our program that you in the future of work on 23rd February, 2022. The program would not have been successful without you. We really appreciate the in-depth knowledge you have shared with us. Thank you yeah. very much, sir. Thank you very much, Honorable Gabriel. I would like to call Millicent Afenia to give us the vote of thanks. Hello, Millicent. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can I be heard? Yes, please. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Hello. Good yes. Evening. Good evening. Can I be heard? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. We're Good hear evening, you. everyone. Okay. To one all present here. To one and all present here, Mr. Senyo Hosi, Nooks Wuhan and Lanjo executives, um, it's an honor to give the Thanksgiving speech. Glory to God for making this webinar a success. A special thanks to Mr. Senyo Hosi for taking time out of his busy schedule to grace the webinar. Thanks for inspiring and encouraging us with your words. To the organizers of the program, Nooks Wuhan and Lanjo and the national executives, uh, participants and volunteers, thank you all. Aiko, Akbe, Oluwadong, uh, Nangode, and Shokan. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, Sister Melissa. It's now time for the closing prayer, and I would like to invite Honorable Mohammed Hak, Lanjo General Secretary, to give us the prayer. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Please, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay, please, let's, let's all be in the mood of prayers. Yeah, we thank the Almighty Allah for making this webinar a success. We also thank Allah for the wonderful discussions time that we had had. As we depart, Allah, we ask you to be with us. May he let what we have discussed today bear fruits in our lives and in the lives of other people. May glory and honor comes back to you in everything that we do. We ask in the name of Allah, Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you all very much. I actually all wanted right. to, Mr. Stenio, if you had any final words, but I forgot. So if you do, you can kindly uh, talk to I, I, I think I've said it all. So guys, keep pushing, keep, keep making Ghana proud where you are. Keep pushing the boundaries. Pick up any learning you can from any corner. Maintain the relationships you have. They are key for your future. I wish you all the best and see you at the top someday. Thank all you right. very much, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.